The Babe led the Bombers to their first world championship in 1923. Great play! A no hitter! Perfect game for John Larson! Kirby Cutter his third home run of the game! Hayes makes the catch! The Yankees win! The Yankees are back on top! World champions for the 27th time! When you look at the 1956 World Series, you had the matchup between the two rivals, the Yankees and the Dodgers, and there was a lot of pressure on the Yankees going into this series. The Yankees hadn't won a World Series since 53. That's a long wait for Yankee fans, but they've lost the pennant in 54. They lost the World Series to Brooklyn in 55. What made the Yankees a great team through the years was how they avenged a loss. Well, that year we, we sold the pennant up pretty early. Mickey had a fine year, you know, great year. Heck, you couldn't have much better year than he had. Yes, it was a triple crown season for Mickey Mantle as he led the league in homers, RBIs, and batting average, and really became like the poster boy for Major League Baseball that year. Mantle, at age 24, also led all of baseball with 132 runs scored and an OPS of 1.169. Catcher Yogi Berra recorded his fourth straight season with at least 100 RBI and finished second in the American League MVP race behind teammate Mickey Mantle. 27-year-old ace Whitey Ford led the Yankees pitching staff with 19 wins, 18 complete games, and 225 and two-thirds innings pitched. In addition, Ford topped the majors with a 2.47 ERA and a 760 winning percentage. 1956 presents an encore performance by the same antagonists who fought it out in a thrilling seven-game series in 1955. The Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Yankees. Yankees manager Casey Stengel chose Whitey Ford to pitch the first game of the World Series at Ebbets Field, which was kind of an unusual choice because Ebbets Field was a very difficult place for left-handed pitchers. In the last half of the second inning, Robinson gets the first hit off Ford. It's a homer into the left field stand. Game one at Ebbets Field, the Yankees offense really completely shut down by Sal Magley, the great right-hander for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He strikes out in one of Magley's baffling curveballs. It's the tenth strikeout for the Barber. Magley had been on a roll. He had thrown a perfect game in September of that year. And he ends up striking out 10 Yankees, winning the first game. Despite home runs by Mickey Mantle and Billy Martin, the Dodgers took a quick one-game-to-nothing lead in the World Series. Jackie Robinson and Gil Hodges added home runs for the Dodgers, backing Sal Magley's strong performance and pushing Brooklyn to a one-game-to-nothing series lead. That sets up a Game 2 matchup between Don Newcomb, who had won 27 games for Brooklyn during the regular season, and he's matched up against... Don Larson, who we would hear about later in the series. In game two, the Yankees jumped to a six to nothing lead, thanks in large part to a grand slam by Yogi Berra. Berra connects and the ball goes high and far over the right field wall. Four more runs, a six to nothing lead, and Yogi has hit the fifth grand slammer in World Series annals. I started the second game in Brooklyn. I didn't do very good. I Got a little wild, Casey didn't like that. I didn't either, so I was gone. The Dodgers scored six runs in that second inning. Dengel brings in Tommy Byrne, a southpaw, to face left-hand hitting Duke Snyder. There it goes over the right center field screen. And this game is tied six and six. Stengel pulled his starting pitcher, Don Larson, during the second inning of the game, as Brooklyn's powerful lineup wore out Yankees pitching during a 13 to eight victory. For the second straight game, Brooklyn fans have something to cheer about. So here are the Yankees with all this pressure on them to beat Brooklyn after the previous World Series, and they're immediately in an 0-2 hole. They're facing a must-win situation, Game 3, going back to the Bronx Yankee Stadium. As much as the first two games of the 1956 World Series were dominated by hitting, the remaining games were dominated by brilliant starting pitching. Now, in Game 3, the Yankees decide to pitch Whitey Ford on short rest. And when we talk about short rest in the 1950s, we're talking about two days rest. Well, it turns out Ford has his good stuff. He is able to defeat Brooklyn. He pitches a very good game. He's also supported offensively by Enos Slaughter, the Hall of Fame outfielder. Hits a three-run home run. And he propels the ball into the right field stand. Scoring Bauer and Bear ahead of him and sending the Yankees out in front, four to two. 
So the Yankees get the win that they need to have in game three. And the Yankees win five to three. The fans depart talking about the ageless slaughter and the excellent pitching of Whitey Ford, who scattered eight hits for his fourth World Series victory. Tom Sturdivant, 26-year-old right-hander who helped the Yankees win the flag with a 16-8 record, will face the National League champion. Ed Roebuck faces Mantle at the start of the Yankees' sixth. The slugger pounds the next one into the center field feature, his second homer of the series and seventh in postseason play. With Andy Carey on first after hitting a single off Don Drysdale in the New York seventh, Bauer wallops his first World Series homer, a shot into the lower left field seat. The Yankees lead six to one. The Yankees are pitching a journeyman, Tom Sturdivant, but he pitches very well, throws a complete game. All of a sudden, the Yankees are back to an even series. But he lifts the fly to Mantle for the final out of the ball game. The 69,705 fans have seen the Yankees fight back to square the series in this fourth match. It's a big moment for Tom Sturdivant, who started his career as an infielder. But the most famous game of the 1956 World Series took place in Game 5. With both teams tied at two wins apiece, in the fifth game of that World Series, history was about to be made. When Larson is actually going to the ballpark that day, he still doesn't know for sure if he's the starting pitcher. The Yankees have not announced anything. When he gets to his locker in the clubhouse, he sees that there is a clean baseball that's been left in his shoe. And that's the signal to him that, yeah, he's going to be the starting pitcher that day. Nobody knew what to expect when Larson took the ball again for Game 5 at Yankee Stadium. As we all know now, it turned out to be one of the greatest moments in New York Yankee and baseball history. I didn't think I'd start again because that's just a lousy effort, because I still had Turley and Cucks yet. But he gave me a second chance in the fifth game. And Stengel would like to get the edge before the action returns to Brooklyn. He had success bringing back Ford for a second start, following an early round knockout in Brooklyn, and he tries it again with Don Larson. Jackie Robinson hit a ball uh, off of Andy Carey's shin at third real hard, and it ricocheted to McDougal, threw him out. The ball caroms off his glove to McDougal, who scoops it up and throws Robbie out. Magley retires the first 11 men to face him. Next to challenge him is Mantle, with two out in the fourth inning. Magley works carefully. The count reaches two and two. And then Mantle hammers the ball down the right field line and into the stands, only a few feet fair. The Yankees lead one to nothing. Mickey made that great play on Hodges in left, left center. Hodges rockets one of Larson's pitches to left center. However, it's Mantle's turn for fielding brilliance as he overhauls the ball and makes a tremendous one-handed catch. Yeah, the funny part about that was the game went on. I didn't play that game. I was sitting on the bench. Finally, the, somebody in, in the seventh inning, don't talk to him. No, why not? He's got a no-hitter. We never thought about perfect games. Thought of no-hitter. And no Dodger has reached first base. He continues his pitching charm through the seventh, and now it's the eighth inning. And as it turns out, he has great stuff, completely dominates the Brooklyn Dodger lineup, retires the first 24 batters through the first eight innings. He's got a 2 nothing lead going to the ninth. Finally, in the ninth inning, everybody in the bench said, hey, put that guy left, put the guy. All the players on the bench were directing the team. Casey turned around and said, shut up. I'm the manager, and I'll tell him where to play. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget that. Everybody got into the game. And that puts him in a position where he has to face the bottom of the Dodger lineup. But the bottom of the Dodger lineup is not easy to get through. They have Carl Furillo batting seventh, very good player, Dodgers right fielder. Guerrero flies to Bauer. And then they have Roy Campanella, their Hall of Fame catcher, batting eighth. Then Campy bounces the ball to Martin and is thrown out. Only one man now blocks Larson from the greatest pitching achievement of all time. The Dodgers, pinch hitting for Sal Magley, their starter, send up veteran outfielder Dale Mitchell, who's in his final Major League season. The first pitch is a ball high. Then a curve for a call strike. 
They swing and strike, and the count is one and two. And I, I remember everything very well. And I think the last strike looked pretty good to me. <laughs> Here comes the pitch. Strike throw. I know her. A perfect game for John Larson. So very dramatic moment. Don Larson, who for the most part was a journeyman pitcher, had some good seasons, but a journeyman right-hander. And on this particular day, October 8th, 1956, it's a perfect game. Larson pitched the only perfect game in World Series history. Nobody reached base as he only threw 97 pitches over the course of the two-hour contest. Larson only allowed one three and two count, and that was to Brooklyn shortstop Pee Wee Reese early in the game. The truly spectacular thing about Larson's perfect game was that every hitter he faced during that game, with the exception of left fielder Sandy Amaros, a fine player in his own right, every single player was either a future member of the Baseball Hall of Fame or a multi-time All-Star. That and the importance of pitching in the World Series made this the greatest game ever pitched. Larson's fantastic performance of retiring 27 men in succession hasn't been accomplished in the major league since 1922. So after the dramatics of Don Larson in game five, we move on to game six. Good pitching matchup, it's Clem Labine taking on the Yankees right-hander Bob Turley, a hard thrower. And both are very much on their game. They, in fact, pitch combined shutouts through the first nine innings. Bob Turley continued the string of great starting pitching performances for the Yankees in Game 6 at Ebbets Field. Turley took a scoreless shutout into the 10th inning, but lost a heartbreaker 1-0 as the Dodgers even the series at three games apiece. Robinson, after a foul and a ball, flashes a drive to left. The leap by Slaughter is in vain. Gilliam comes home in the single with a run, which wins for the Dodgers 1-0. That means they had lost all three games played at Ebbets Field in the series and had to play game seven at Ebbets Field. It's a tough one for Turley to lose and a grand one for Levine to win. The crowd saw two great pitchers today and baseball drama at its best. Every game has its heroes. One of them certainly was Robinson, who delivered the big hit. Game seven on paper is a pitching matchup that definitely favors Brooklyn. They have Don Newcomb who won 27 games during the regular season. Casey Stengel handed the ball to Johnny Cooks. But Yogi Berra had Newcomb's number that day as he had two long home runs. But Yogi connects, and it's another homer over the right center wall. It's 10 runs batted in for Yogi, an all-time World Series record. The Yankees go ahead, four to nothing. The Yankees pulled away from their Brooklyn rivals and New York first baseman Bill Scourin hit a grand slam. There goes the first pitch, a homer into the left field seat. That makes it nine to nothing. Two records tumble. It's the 12th homer of the series for the Yankees and it's the first time the same team has hit two grand slammers in the same series. Well, the Yankees took care of business scoring early and often a nine nothing shutout as they celebrated Ebbets Field turning the tables on what the Dodgers had done to them the year before. The Yankees, with this 9 to nothing crusher, have won their 17th World Series. The long struggle is over, and it's a time of victorious madness for the Yankees, who came back after losing the first two games. Yogi Berra led the Yankees' offense with 10 RBI and a 360 batting average, while matching Mickey Mantle's three home runs. Enos Slaughter hit 350 as Billy Martin and Hank Bauer combined for 17 hits. The Yankees staff pitched to a 2.48 team ERA, and while Johnny Cooks, Tom Sturdivant, and Whitey Ford won one game apiece, it was Don Larson's perfect game five that will forever be etched into baseball history as one of the greatest games ever pitched. 1956 World Series would be the last Subway Series in New York for 44 years. It was the final appearance for the Brooklyn Dodgers who would move to the West Coast after the 57 season. And then not until 2000, when the Yankees played the Mets, was the term Subway Series revived. But the New York Yankees wouldn't have to wait until 2000 to win another Fall Classic as they would return in 1958 for yet another seven-game thriller.